In lore and mythology, vampires are fascinating creatures. Hollywood has come to romanticize the idea of their bloodlust. And while many people enjoy the entertainment value vampire stories bring, a few individuals have taken the concept of becoming immortal to extreme levels. These are five disturbing real-life vampires. Number five, Rod Farrell. In 1995, 15-year-old Rod Farrell was a disturbed teen. He developed a taste for the macabre, started taking drugs and practiced witchcraft, saturating himself with death, hate, war, and pain. After being enamored by a vampire video game, he founded and headed his own vampire clan, claiming himself to be a 500-year-old vampire named Visago. An aspiring member of the clan was 15-year-old Heather Wendorf. She had been living in Eustis, Florida when Farrell, together with Charity Keese, Scott Anderson, and Dana Cooper, who were fellow members, went for a visit. Rod and Heather had been friends for a while and she allegedly told him that her parents were mistreating her. The plan was to pick her up and then head back to Kentucky. Unfortunately, the group's car broke down while in Florida and it was decided they would take the Wendorf's Ford Explorer instead. Heather informed Rod and Scott the keys to the vehicle would be inside the bedroom and said she would unlock the garage door so they could get inside the house. Before going through with the plan, the group initiated Heather into their clan in a ceremony called Crossing Over, which involved cutting each other and drinking one another's blood. Then at 9 p.m., the girls dropped Rod and Scott in front of Heather's home. According to Rod, they couldn't find the bedroom and he snapped. He started bludgeoning and attacking her father who was sleeping on the couch, hitting him more than 20 times with a crowbar. Scott just stood shocked and stunned as Rod danced around Richard's body, and that's when Noma, her mother, entered the room. Farrell then attacked her and bludgeoned her to death as well. Afterwards, the group drove out of town and Heather's sister, Jennifer, found the body shortly after and called police. Rod dumped the murder weapon in the Mississippi River en route to New Orleans. On the road, they were stopped five times by cops who were now on a manhunt. Farrell would politely tell them they were college students on a road trip and they were always allowed to go on. At some point, they ran out of money and Charity decided to phone her mother for help. They holed up in a motel in Baton Rouge and Charity's mother informed police about where the group was and they were arrested. Rod was sentenced to death for his crime, but that was later commuted to life in prison. Scott Anderson also received the same sentence as an accessory. Meanwhile, Charity and Dana received 10 and 17 years respectively, and both women have since been released. Heather was never charged because she had not known about the plan to kill her parents and only found out they were dead while they were on the road. Number 4. Mercy Brown, the Vampire Child In 1892, tuberculosis or consumption swept through many states. Those inflicted would experience severe fevers, cough up blood, experience sunken eyes and deteriorate physically as if life was being drained from their bodies. The disease became so widespread that people started believing a sinister force was behind it. Residents soon blamed the presence of the undead or vampires, especially in areas like Vermont, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. In the town of Exeter, Rhode Island, lived 19-year-old Mercy Lena Brown. Exeter was largely a farming town. Everyone knew everyone, so a disease like consumption was no secret. A lot of families suffered, but the Brown family had it bad. Mercy's mother, Mary Eliza, was the first to suffer and die from it in December of 1832. The following year, her sister Mary died, and by 1891, Mercy and her brother Edwin also contracted the disease. Edwin tried to fend it off by moving to Colorado Springs, hoping a change in climate would make him feel better. Mercy did not show signs so quickly and apparently she had the galloping kind. This form went undetected for years, but once symptoms began to show, it resulted in a rapid deterioration of the victim. When a doctor examined Mercy, he informed her father it was useless to try and cure her, and a few months later, she died in January of 1892. Edwin returned from Colorado, but in a near-dying condition. 
Friends and neighbors approached George, the father, to offer an alternative route. They explained that perhaps there was a more diabolical force behind the family deaths, indicating that maybe one of the girls who had recently died was undead and feasting on the living tissue and blood of Edwin. The townsfolk persuaded George that if the corpse was found and its heart destroyed, then it would help Edwin recover. George was desperate and he gave his permission and several men and a doctor exhumed the bodies of his family on March 17th. Both Mary and her mother's bodies were nothing more than bones since they had been dead for over a decade. However, Mercy's body was in a nearly perfectly preserved condition. When it was examined, the doctor emphasized her lungs showed signs of the disease, but the people were undeterred. They cut out her heart and discovered a blood clot, believing she was indeed the undead and had been feasting on Edwin's living body. The villagers burned her heart and lungs and then took the ashes. These were placed in a drink and given to Edwin, believing it would cure him or restore his health. However, two months later, he passed away. Number 3. Sutomu Miyazaki Born in Tokyo in 1962, Sutomu was premature and weighed only 4.5 pounds. He also suffered a birth deformity causing his joints and hands to be fused. As a result, he couldn't bend his wrists upwards and the deformity caused him great embarrassment and distress as he grew older. In elementary school, he was remembered as a bright but quiet student who had trouble making friends. By high school, he lost interest in his studies and began to withdraw, collecting graphic porn videos, slasher films, and anime. In May of 1988, his grandfather, who was the only person who ever showed him support, passed away, and that's when his connection to society and the world was severed. Three months later, he started his killing spree. His first victim was four-year-old Mari Kono. She went out to play at a friend's house, but by 6 p.m. hadn't returned and her father, in a panic, called police. While she was walking to her friend's house, Sotumo pulled up and coerced her to come in. He took her into the woods before settling under a tree, and that's where he strangled her. After she died, he undressed and sexually fondled her. He then removed the clothes, casually walked out of the forest, and allowed the body to decompose before returning later on to cut off the hands and feet. In October, he was driving on a rural road when he pulled over to offer seven-year-old Masami Yashizawa a ride. She accepted and he took her to the same area of the woods that he did his first victim. He abused the corpse in the same way, and her body was found a few hundred yards away from Mari. His third victim, a four-year-old named Erika Namba, he kidnapped her while she was on her way home from a friend's house. This time, though, he took her to a parking lot and forced her to remove her clothes in the back seat. He started taking pictures when a car headlight momentarily shone past him. In a panic, he started strangling and eventually killed her. Even though Sutomu did not kill again until June of 1989, he kept busy by taunting the families of the victims. Random phone calls as well as mysterious letters were sent detailing the deaths of the victims. His final kill was five-year-old Ayako Namoto. He convinced her to let him take pictures of her. When he handed her a stick of gum in the car, she commented about his hands and this put him in a rage. He then strangled her and spent the next two days engaging in sexual activity with the corpse while taking various pictures and videos. After her body started decomposing, he hacked off her head, hands, and feet and hid the torso in a public cemetery. He tossed her other bones and the skull in a wooded area, which he later retrieved and kept in a storage space behind his bedroom. Sutomu then drank the blood and roasted the hands in his backyard and ate them. He was finally captured when he stopped to pick up another young girl. This time she was with her nine-year-old sister and he told her to stay put while he encouraged the little girl to go with him to a nearby river. The older sister then ran home and told her father, and when he arrived on the scene, he saw his daughter naked and the young man pointing a zoom lens on the girl's private parts. Sutomu managed to run away, however he tried to retrieve his car and was captured by police. Reporters went into his house and discovered he had amassed nearly 6,000 videos of child porn, slasher films, and anime as well as pictures and videos of some of his victims. 
His father refused to pay for his lawyers, and in grief and shame for what his son had done, he committed suicide. Sutomu Miyazaki was tried for his crimes despite his lawyers attempting to use an insanity plea. He was sentenced to die on April 14, 1997, and was hanged in June of 2008. Number 2. Peter Curtin, the Vampire of Dusseldorf Born in 1883 to a dysfunctional and poor family, Peter was the oldest child. His father was a skilled worker but a severe and sadistic alcoholic that would abuse the family regularly. By nine, he befriended a dog catcher who would torture the animals he caught. Peter joined him and willingly tortured and killed animals as well, and he also claims to have drowned two of his playmates around this time. As he grew older, he would engage in sodomy with the animals he found and got pleasure in stabbing them while engaging in the act. At 16, he ran away and was embroiled in petty crimes, landing him in prison over and over again. The first known murder he committed was on nine-year-old Christine Klein. Peter had been burglarizing inns and taverns, and in one of them he found her sleeping in a bedroom. He entered the room and strangled her before slitting her throat using a small pocket knife. The blood spurted from her neck and Peter was aroused by it. A few days later, he was arrested for various arson and burglaries and sent to prison for six years. When he got out, he lived with his sister and met his wife, and they returned to Dusseldorf in 1925. In 1929, Peter began another killing spree. He accosted an elderly woman, pouncing on her and dragging her to some nearby brush where she was stabbed 24 times with a pair of scissors, and somehow she survived. He then attacked a nine-year-old girl, strangling her before stabbing her multiple times in the head, stomach, heart, and genitals. He temporarily hit her body, then returned to it later and set it on fire, achieving orgasm while watching the flames. He said he attacked four women after that, but there were no official murders linked to him again until August 11th, when he raped, repeatedly strangled, and stabbed Maria Hahn. Three months later, he sent an anonymous confession letter to the police, including a crude map of where she was buried. Soon after this, he attacked two little girls, strangling and stabbing them. One of them, Louise Lenzen, was not only killed, but Peter had bit her and sucked the blood from the wounds. A chain of events would lead to his final arrest. Peter helped a young woman named Maria who was new to town and looking for a place to stay. He propositioned her for sex, but she refused. Peter accepted this calmly and walked her back to the train station, but instead of taking her to the lodging house, he took her to a wooded area and then raped her. This time he didn't kill her, but instead let her go. Maria never reported the incident, but told a friend in a letter. But she wrote in the wrong address, and the letter was opened at the post office. The postmaster forwarded it to police, who then tracked down Maria, and then she led them to Peter's apartment. On trial, he admitted to committing a total of 79 individual acts of crime. He could recall nearly all of them in near photographic detail, and was found guilty and charged with nine murders and seven attempted murders. He never showed any remorse for his crimes, and was sentenced to death and beheaded on July 2, 1931. Number 1. Richard Chase, The Vampire of Sacramento From a young age, Richard showed signs of abnormal behavior. He grew up with strict disciplinarian parents. He also bedwed at an older age, started setting fires, and tortured animals. In 1968, at 18 years old, he moved out of his home because he thought his mother was trying to poison him. He started capturing and torturing animals, hoping to cure various delusional ailments. He would consume them raw, or sometimes create smoothies by mixing them with coke and drinking those. Then in 1975, he was admitted to a mental institution when he injected rabbit's blood into his veins. At the hospital, he was nicknamed Dracula because he captured two little birds, cut their heads off, and started sucking their blood. He was pumped with antipsychotic medication, and the following year was released under his parents' care. His mother decided he didn't need the medication anymore and weaned him off of it. She also got him an apartment, 
And that's when Richard's delusions and psychotic tendencies only worsened. His first murder was shooting 52-year-old Ambrose Griffin on December 29, 1977 in a drive-by. Then on January 11th, he attacked a neighbor and started breaking and entering into homes. In his mind, any unlocked door was a sign of invitation, while a locked door meant he wasn't welcome. His second murder was on January 23rd when he entered the home of Teresa Whalen. She was home alone and went out to take the garbage when Chase went inside the house. He shot her three times, then raped her corpse while stabbing her. Afterwards, he cut out her organs, ate them, and drank her blood. On January 27th, he struck again. This time, it was the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Marath. She was inside with her 6-year-old son, Jason, and her friend, Danny, and his 22-month-year-old nephew. When Richard entered, he shot Danny in the head, instantly killing him. He then stole Danny's wallet and keys and shot the 22-month-old before running after Jason. He was hiding inside his mother's bedroom, and he shot him twice in the head. Then he found Evelyn in the bathroom, shot her there, and dragged her body to the bed. He proceeded to rape and sodomize her. He cut open, removed her organs, and attempted to remove one of her eyeballs. But while he was desecrating the corpse, a six-year-old girl knocked on the door who was there for a play date. This startled him and he fled the crime scene using Danny's car. When the bodies were discovered and the crime scene examined, they found perfect handprints and shoe prints left by Chase in Danny's blood. During his arrest, Chase was still carrying Danny's wallet and inside his apartment was blood evidence including a blender used to chop the organs and remains of people and animals. Inside his freezer, with the organs of Evelyn and Teresa, many of them neatly packed in Tupperware containers. Chase was charged with six counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to die in the gas chamber. Before it was followed through with, however, he was found dead in his prison cell from an overdose of depression prescription pills. So there were five disturbing real-life vampires. Vampirism is not just for the movies, but it actually happens in real life, and these people are proof. Their delusions drove them to commit sadistic acts, causing pain and harm to many, many families. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider supporting our Patreon page and remember to subscribe to our channel so we can bring you new videos every single week. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.